Hello everyone, Ladislas Moyes from TheWanderingInvestor.com. So today I'm really excited to be having a discussion with, with Calvin Froge from Twitter. Calvin, how are you? Good. Thanks for having me. So today we're in his lodge. It's essentially an Airbnb. You have a few apartments here, so I'm staying here for a few days with my family. The views are absolutely wonderful. We're in northern Panama in Boquete. Um, so this is the little town of Boquete. It's a little retirement haven for a lot of Americans. So Calvin, can you tell us, when did you move here? So I started looking into leaving the U.S. Uh, sort of after I finished the Appalachian Trail. Uh, I was working 80 hours a week as a contract programmer. And uh, I'm sort of asking myself, you know, I'm kind of working today for the government. I work tomorrow for myself. I, you know, do that on repeat. So there's something wrong here. Uh, if I'm working this hard and I'm making this kind of money, then I should, you know, probably be, uh, you know, saving more, investing more, have a higher standard of living. So that was kind of when I decided that I was getting a, a raw deal uh, as an American living in an American city. That was uh, 2015 or so when I really came to that conclusion. So I started looking for uh, uh, alternatives and uh, 2016 I decided that I was coming to uh, Panama. 2017 was my first full year here. So now we're about to uh, head into 2023. So uh, this, I, you know, I guess it'll be my uh, uh, fifth, sixth full year uh, coming up. Nice. And why Panama? Why not some other destination in Europe or somewhere else in Latin America? So I'm sure you're aware of uh, and talk to your subscribers about what territorial tax systems are. Basically, a territorial tax system is just, you know, you you don't have to pay taxes on uh, income sources that come from outside of that particular territory where you are. So if you live in Panama and you have a business in Costa Rica, for example, or Colombia, or anywhere in the world, you don't have to pay taxes on that to Panama. There's actually a specific line on your Panamanian tax return where you just put foreign source, and it's not uh, included in your renta gravable, your taxable income. Uh, it's just completely exempted. So uh, Panama, when I came down here, had a, this thing called the Friendly Nations Visa, uh, they still have it, but they've they've changed the requirements. When I came, uh, you essentially had to pay a few thousand dollars to do some paperwork. You had to put five thousand dollars in a bank account for three months, and uh, then you got uh, permanent residency with a path to citizenship. So it seemed at the time like it was the best deal in the world. Uh, I already spoke some Spanish, so I decided that you know that was the one I would pursue. And then I I came here specifically because uh, I basically looked at a topo map. I knew I didn't want to be in the beach. I didn't I knew I didn't want to be, you know, kind of those middle elevations. Uh, I didn't want to, you know, have bugs. I didn't want to have snakes. I didn't want to, you know, have uh, hot weather. So, uh, you know, this place is, uh, you know, kind of cool, high altitude uh, tropics. It stays between 55 Fahrenheit and 75 Fahrenheit year-round, which is uh, cold for some people, but uh, perfect for me. Um, so uh, yeah, I've, I've been uh, generally happy with the move uh, so far. It's definitely, I think, been uh, a good decision financially. Um, you know, living here, there are issues like there are anywhere else, um, but I like being surrounded by nature, uh, I like uh, being in a, a you know very diverse place. There's people here from all over the world. You, know, you can go to the farmers market and you know meet people from probably 20 countries that have uh, that have moved here. Uh, you can get you know it's a small town, but I think there's 200 restaurants or something. Uh, we've got you know lots of different grocery stores. People that import from uh, all over the world. People that you know, you can get weird stuff that you would normally only see in China or Korea. Uh, you can get, uh, you know, stuff that you would normally only see in Spain because people have moved here from those places and started import businesses, started, uh, uh, you know, sort of uh, bringing their families here. You know, the 
population of Panama and the Chinese presence is huge. There's lots of Americans, a lot of expats have moved here, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of Germans. Uh, so a lot of people from all over the world. There aren't very many people my age that came here to do, uh, you know, for primarily financial reasons. There, I mean, I'd say that there are more in other parts of Panama uh, because I help quite a lot of clients move to Panama because especially for non-U.S. people moving to Panama, you can essentially, if you want to, reduce your tax rate to zero, which is really interesting for Americans. That doesn't quite work this way in most cases. I don't want to talk about this. It's a can of worms, U.S. taxes. Um, but when you look at Panama, I mean, you chose here Boquete, which is absolutely lovely, especially with all the hiking and the volcanoes and all that. Uh, but it's a lot of retired people. Yeah. And But if you want, you know, the big city life, if people want that, you can find that in Panama. You just go to Panama City. If you want more of the, the Caribbean vibe, you can go to Bocas. If you want some more surf towns on the Pacific, you have that as well. So Panama has quite a lot to offer. And like you said, it's very diverse. So there, generally, there's something for everyone. Yeah. Panama ticks a lot of boxes. It's not perfect, for sure. I mean, we were discussing before offline that you've seen a lot of waves, because you've been here for quite a few years, of people who come here from the U.S. and then they leave. So a lot of people come and here I've, and then they, they uh, fail. Right, yeah. So uh, I've also run uh, basically a retreat for uh, programmers before. Uh, so I've also myself brought a l actually a lot of young people from uh, all over the world here. But what I've seen is that, you know, kind of on the U.S. political cycle, at least for the Americans, when Trump got elected, a bunch of people came down here because, you know, Trump's going to destroy America. When Biden got elected, a bunch of people came down here because, you know, Biden's going to destroy America. So I'm sure, you know, the next election, you're going to get the same thing, you know. And to, to be clear, they're all destroying America. <laughs> so, uh, so yeah, I've definitely seen that. Um, from bringing uh, young people here, I mean, I brought people from Sweden, Norway, the U.S., Canada, the U.K. I mean, I helped a lot of people get permanent residency here. Uh, all, and most of these were young people that, uh, that I brought. Only a few of them stayed here in Bolquete. You know, it's a retirement town and it's, uh, you know, there's, there's young people, but you know, you have to really speak Spanish to interact with most of those young people. So uh, a lot of the young people that come here, they end up either in Panama City or in Bocas del Toro. You know, Panama City, that's where, you know, a lot of the, the jobs for expats are. Panama's also got these like free trade zones. Uh, they've got a lot of incentives for uh, uh, companies to put their corporate headquarters and house their executives here. I think they can. They have a program where uh, corporate execs can live in Panama and basically be exempted even from domestic income tax for companies that move their corporate headquarters here. Uh, they've also got you know some kind of special economic zones like Ciudad del Saber, uh, where uh, you know they also have incentives for uh, for companies that that go there. You know, for me, the city, it's like, it's a lot of traffic. Uh, there's a lot of pollution. You know, the, the one particular case, they were supposed to build a water treatment plant. Uh, the land was purchased and they, they built a mall instead. So, you know, the, the city has some, you know, some great things too. Uh, one of the best Korean restaurants that I'd ever, I've ever been to anywhere in the world. And I, I've traveled in Asia. I lived in Hawaii for, for uh, four years as well. So, um, I've definitely eaten some good Korean food. One of the probably the best Korean restaurant I've ever eaten at in my life is in Panama City. Uh, good, good omakase place. So, yeah, Panama is very diverse. But you know, for me, you know, the weather here mm -hmm. um, and kind of the fact that I don't have to deal with traffic. You know, I mean, for me, those are the. Mm -hmm. I don't want to wait in line. I don't want to be sweating my ass off. Right. Those are, those are those are my kind of boxes. <laughs> Cool. Yeah, because I, I mean, I've traveled also quite a bit in, in Latin America and just comparing with like Mexico or Colombia. Personally, I find that the heart would choose Mexico or Colombia because it's more exciting. I prefer places that are a bit more exciting than Panama. But Panama is just such a logical destination from a it just ticks so many boxes from a financial point of view, from a practical point of view. The financial system here is. So what's 
far, far from perfect. It's still leagues above anything that you'll find anywhere else in Latin America. So from, yeah. from that point of view, it's, it's attractive. Yeah, well, you've got dollar-denominated accounts with decent yields. The banks are pretty conservative. So if you're think looking for a place to deposit money, uh, you still need to spread it out a little bit. But, you know, Panama's about as safe a place as any, I think, to put money in. Uh, there's, I think... 75 banks or something here between uh, general and international banking licenses and I think in the time that I've been here I've only seen one go bust mm -hmm. and that was kind of more like a kind of a you know a credit union uh, sort of uh, you know local That's type thing. less than in the US or in Europe. Yeah so I mean just just as an example you know they won't let they, they basically won't give loans to foreigners they basically uh, they they won't give loans to entrepreneurs unless you know they ha they come from like a very uh, kind of privileged uh, background, very you know prestigious. They have inside connections at the bank. Um, the 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 bread and butter for <laughs> banks here is uh, you know serving the government and uh, deposits, right? Like they have a like a subsidized house program for citizens that's you know one percent uh, interest rate or something. So. Uh, they don't make a lot of money on that uh, as far as interest goes, but they also uh, they don't carry any any risk. You know, the government basically puts up um, all of the uh, all of the capital. Um, if you're a government employee, it's very easy to uh, get uh, loans here as well because you know they essentially don't ever fire government employees. <laughs> um, yeah, labor laws are yeah. not fun here. Yeah, the labor system here is not, I can't, you know, really say a lot of good things about it. I think in a lot of ways, the labor system here sort of keeps wages low. Uh, the social security system, for example, you, uh, you pay into social security, you know, based on how much you pay somebody. So if you pay somebody more then but you know, you as the employer, you have to pay more into social security as well. Um, so, uh, you know, it's 30, 30 something percent uh, it might not be exactly right but that range of uh, the paycheck for any employee that you have so it's a it's a pretty significant expense um, and obviously one that gets bigger as the wage goes up the other thing is if somebody you know decides that you've treated them unfairly or you know uh, unjust terminations for example I fired somebody one time for they worked for me for like a month they were just doing a bad job um, they uh, basically went to the labor board, said that I uh, fired them unjustly, and uh, I obviously didn't agree, but the, you know, the labor board made me pay uh, a, another month's salary to them. Um, and uh, so if I had been paying them, you know, more, that termination fee would have been even higher. So there's just, you know, there's an incentive to keep wages low, not so much because people don't want to pay more for labor, but if they pay more for labor, they also have to pay more to the government. They're exposing themselves to more risk. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll, I'll, there's a lot of uh, informal employment here. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the government tries to crack down on informal employment. Um, but the reason that there's informal employment is because it's such a massive pain to deal with the labor system. Mm -hmm. you, know, deal, you know, getting any of these contracts through, um, you know, if you, uh, if you want to inscribe somebody in a, in a plan, you know, it's something that's going to take your accountant, you know, like literally a day of work to, you know, to have to, to go deal with, go back and forth. You got to, you know, here you have to get lots of things notarized. So it's a very, very bureaucratic system. Like most of Latin America. Yeah, it's extremely bureaucratic. Um, as an American, it will drive you nuts to do business here. I mean, the first couple of years, I literally thought that I was going crazy. And then, you know, it basically, I've just figured out that you, <coughs> you basically just have to pay somebody and, you know, and then just keep calling them and, and saying, is it done yet? And, you know, don't go and do it yourself, but, you know, pay somebody and then keep asking them if they finished it yet. Right? That's the, that's kind of the most effective way to, to get stuff done here. And I, I've got I've got friends who do business at all levels here. Um, you know, I, I have uh, uh, friends who own you know large tracts of land, do big industrial developments, commercial developments. Uh, you know, I've had extensive conversations about uh, you know all these things, and you know. People say, well, you know, the nice thing is that, you know, you, uh, it's a little bit more of Wild West, so 
Uh, I, have, I have a friend that was trying to get a housing development, like a neighborhood permitted. He went and slept on the couch in the tour in the uh, in the uh, like uh, environmental approvals office in Panama City, and uh, he's you know just on the couch. He ends up going to the secretary's birthday. And eventually, the lady that runs the office comes out and says, "Who is who is this gringo who has been sleeping on the couch for the you know the past week and is like all always here and seems to know all of your names and be going places with you?" And they're like, "Oh, he's this guy that's you know trying to do some residential development in Cherokee, you know." And so then that was how he eventually got it permitted because he just you know could not get a decision maker to look at it without going through the steps of like becoming part of the family. So that's, you know, that's sort of, it, 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 yeah, it does sound like a nightmare, and it should for a lot of that stuff. But there are, you know, also a lot of uh, benefits to being here. It's so dysfunctional that you don't really get bothered, yeah. you know. Um, I, like I said, the banks are super conservative. I think it's a safe place. And you can, you can to, have to guns as well as a uh, Oh, yeah. I mean, dude, it's easier here to get it. Okay, as far as like the actual investigation that goes into whether or not you should have a gun, it takes more time here. You have to pay more, okay? But there's like zero diligence done, okay? That's good. Anybody can get a gun. Anybody nice. can get a gun in this country. That's nice. So essentially, you can move to Panama. If you're not a U.S. person, you can go down to 0% taxes if you structure things properly. If you have a business overseas, you don't actually have to deal with the bureaucracy here at all. So I think that's... That's a big plus. And then you can have a gun. Not that you really yeah. need it, but just out of principle, if you want a gun, you can get a gun. Yeah, well, I mean, I guess, you know, each person can decide whether or not they want a gun. I, I know an, another lady, uh, a story of another lady that, you know, basically uh, she had a uh, deposit in a bank and she didn't want to, you know, they didn't want to basically pay her in cash. And she went down there and waved a gun around and she got her cash and didn't go to jail. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she's a hero. <laughs> this lady's a hero. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, there's uh, uh, there's definitely a, a huge kind of, you know, Texas, Montana, uh, armed to the teeth, gun-owning contingent here. There's a lot of South Africans, too. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, there's, you know, huge kind of, you know, gun clubs here. Uh, you'll see you know, people in the mall, like, you know, sitting around, you know, having their like meetups for, but you know, you, you also it open carry. Um, it's uh, it's not open carry. Okay. Um, it's uh, concealed carry. Okay. But you know, they'll like you know just basically meet up to like you know talk and you know apply for more permits to get you know more guns. I mean, you, you go to the the mall in Albrook and just like you know hang out at the cafes and. You'll see some of the you know local people that live in that area and you know kind of the things that they're into, um, but yeah, there's definitely there's definitely a gun culture here. Um, you see adver- you know billboards, mm-hmm. you know, with people trying to sell guns. So if you want to live like a you know kind of Texas Montana, you know redneck life and you know not really have anybody uh, ever bother you, not pay uh, any taxes on land, not pay any taxes on your, uh, you know, primary residence, you know, get a good interest rate, you know, essentially never have to deal with anything, you know, I mean, they don't even know where you live. They don't even know what your address is. They don't even keep track of address system, the address here. Like I named my street. (laughs) I gave myself an address. Okay. (laughs) The bank statements here don't, do not have addresses on them. Okay. Like the, try getting your utility bill changed from the person that you bought your house from. I mean, they don't even know who's paying which power bills, okay? Like, it's it's total chaos in a lot of ways, <laughs> which, you know, if you're a freedom-loving person, I mean, I think a, a very disorganized government definitely has its advantages to a well-organized government. Uh, and there's some things that they're organized about. But, but they were quite organized during the whole lockdowns. Yeah, it's like, th- th- on paper they were, and Panama City was pretty bad. Um, you know, you couldn't uh, you couldn't go out for a walk in Panama City during uh, you know around Christmas time, for example. They had uh, 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 complete lockdowns on you know people being outside. the The number of days that those really strict measures were in effect, um, maybe it was a couple months in total. Um, but at the same time that that was going on, you know, you also uh, 
you you know could basically walk out on the street and you know tell the cop you know hey you know I need to buy some cigarettes and uh, I need to know where it's open and the cop would tell you you know which chino you could go into the back door of to go buy cigarettes which you know not that I was buying cigarettes but you know it's just an example of uh, of kind of how it works here like they had these uh, these papers that uh, they were giving out to anybody that applied to them to it was called a permiso de circular to go out and drive right so that you could so during the pandemic strict lockdowns there's all these lawyers and diplomats here in Boquete basically just you know having a grand old time um, you know and the the rest of the country is supposed to be locked down they've got gendered days for going to the grocery store uh, they were spraying airplane wings with disinfectant okay so at the same time that all this absolute madness was going on you know you've got the ambassador for Cuba's at the golf course you know the uh, their people are out playing golf like you know all the lawyers kids or you know politicians kids are here in the restaurants and the bars on the dating sites you know like it was it was complete <laughs> complete hypocrisy um, but uh, it was I, I don't think the actual enforcement was anything close to as strict as it was in Europe and if you stayed out of the cities I think that you, you know, other than needing to go to the grocery store, you really didn't have your life uh, affected too much unless you lost your job. And a lot of people did lose their jobs. Mm -hmm. The unemployment rate here after the pandemic hit like 20%. Mm -hmm. uh, I think like a third of the restaurants in the country, like a third of the hotels in the country, maybe, mm -hmm. maybe even more, um, actually went out of business uh, mm -hmm. during, uh, during the pandemic. Like the last year, 2021, it was great for anybody that owned lodgings because so many people had been shut down that when they reopened everything, there just wasn't enough capacity. Wow. You know that so there was literally last year not a single room available on many nights of the year to wow. rent here in Boquete. And I'm driving around looking at all of these places that shut down that are still shut down that could have been, you know, making hundreds of dollars a night, and yeah, well. they were shut down. So, yeah, it's it. I would say the 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 ruling principle of Panama is probably chaos. Which is a positive thing. It's what you want. <laughs> when you want freedom, you want to be living in jurisdictions where the government is just a bit powerless to, to do much. That's where you find true freedom. What about Panama's foreign policy? Um, well, uh, another interesting story. I'm not sure if this is hearsay or if this actually happened, but the story is that uh, this town in particular got some money from the Taiwanese government to do some uh, water project and uh, or and that Panama got money to do uh, infrastructure projects from the Taiwanese government and then the government changed and then they turned around and did the same deals with the Chinese so um, you know and, and then uh, you know the China now has uh, was talking about putting a rail high-speed rail across Panama they they own a, a new uh, a port down on the Amador uh, causeway they built like a cruise cruise line terminal um, so they have based definitely made inroads on uh, developing infrastructure here there are entire neighborhoods in Panama where you only see Chinese people where you only see Jewish people where you only see Arabs where you only see Indians um, so I would say that the foreign policy here is like you know anybody who pays can play you okay. know there's so it's pragmatic there's, it's very pragmatic there Good. is there is like zero dogmatism I think in politics here um, there's definitely a very prevailing sort of protectionist sentiment they're very protectionist of the labor system they don't want you know I mean Venezuelans are probably the most despised people in mm -hmm. Panama because they come here and they they uh, they work you know jobs cheaper than Panamanians uh, would they do it uh, you know a lot illegally under the table so people feel in Panama about you know Venezuelans like Texans feel about Mexicans you know or Hondurans uh, uh, it's very much uh, you know they took our jobs mm -hmm. you know um, mm -hmm. and in some cases they are taking their jobs yeah, they are. but uh, but in a lot of cases there's also you know there are not enough Panamanians to do a lot of jobs there probably aren't enough you know I know that there aren't enough Panamanian programmers Mm -hmm. or you know scientists or uh, you know engineers people doing like you know industrial stuff mm -hmm. um, there you know there's not a very there's not much of a manufacturing base here at all um, 
there's some commodities base, but it could be a lot bigger. Uh, I think Panama could definitely do with liberalizing its labor policies mm -hmm. a bit more, but I, I don't think that there is a strong foreign policy bent. Um, they just kind of do, you know, whatever's pragmatic at the time to get what they want at the time. Which is good. Cool. Fantastic. Calvin, thank you very much. So I really encourage people to follow Calvin on, on Twitter. You're, you're a very fun follow. Um, and also, Calvin has a Substack. There's a link below. I subscribe myself. You talk quite a bit about Panama. It's quite insightful. So I, I constantly learn about Panama through, through your Substack. But it's not only Panama, it's also investments. And if you're interested in moving to Panama, there's a link below. You can speak to my immigration lawyers. There is a, you can get an information package from them. And also if you want to speak to a good real estate agent here in the Boquete area, there's a link below. Calvin, it was a real pleasure. Yeah. Thank you very much, man. Yeah, yeah. You can go to my website, thewanderinginvestor.com and sign up to the private list. It's entirely free. This way you will be getting insider information as I travel around the world looking for opportunities. Lastly, feel free to follow me on Instagram at The Wandering Investor. I look forward to hearing from you.